Found in Earth By Isaac Asimov Audiobook 13 of 27 He would dearly love to make an important discovery of his own. His finding of the wording of the word Aurora was legitimate and made him happier than you can imagine. He wanted desperately to find more. Trevis said, Are you telling me he wanted to make a discovery so badly he convinced himself he had come upon a functioning robot when he hadn't? What he came upon was a lump of rust containing no more consciousness than the rock against which it rested. But you supported his story. I could not bring myself to rob him of his discovery. He means so much to me. Trevi stared at her for a full minute, then he said, Do you mind explaining why he means so much to you? I want to know. I really want to know. To you he must seem an elderly man with nothing romantic about him. He's an isolate, and you despise isolates. You're young and beautiful and there must 61 other parts of Gaia that have the bodies of vigorous and handsome young Am. With them you can have a physical relationship that can resonate through Gaia and bring peaks of ecstasy. So what do you and Injanov? Bliss looked at Trevi solemnly. Don't you love him? Trevi shrugged and said, I'm fond of him. I suppose you could say, in a non-sexual way, that I love him. You haven't known him very long, Trevise. Why do you love him, in that non-sexual way of yours? Trevise found himself smiling without being aware of it. He's such an odd fellow. I honestly think that never in his life has he given a single thought to himself. He was ordered to go along with me, and he went. No objection. He wanted me to go to Trantor but when I said I wanted to go to Gaia, he never argued. And now he's come along with me in this search for Earth, though he must know it's dangerous. I feel perfectly confident that if he had to sacrifice his life for me or for anyone he would, and without repining. Would you give your life for him, Trevis? I might, if I didn't have time to think. If I did have time to think, I would hesitate and I might funk it. I'm not as good as he is. And because of that, I have this terrible urge to protect and keep him good. I don't want the galaxy to teach him not to be good. Do you understand? And I have to protect him from you particularly. I can't bear the thought of you tossing him aside when whatever nonsense amuses you now is done with. Yes, I thought you'd think something like that. Don't you suppose I see in Pell what you see in him and even more so, since I can contact his mind directly? Do I act as though I want to hurt him? Would I support his fantasy of having seen a functioning robot, if it weren't that I couldn't bear to hurt him? Trevise, I am used to what you would call goodness, for every part of Gaia is ready to be sacrificed for the whole. We know and understand no other course of action. But we give up nothing in so doing, for each part is the whole, though I don't expect you to understand that. Pell is something different. Bliss was no longer looking at Trevise. It was as though she were talking to herself. He is an isolate. He is not selfless because he is a part of a greater whole. He is selfless because he is selfless. Do you understand me? He has all to lose and nothing to gain, and yet he is what he is. He shames me for being what I am without fear of loss, when he is what he is without hope of gain. She looked up at Trevise again now, very solemnly. Do you know how much more I understand about him than you possibly can? And do you think I would harm him in any way? Trevise said, Bliss, earlier today, you said, Come let us be friends, and all I replied was, if you wish. That was grudging of me, for I was thinking of what you might do to Janov. It is my turn, now. Come, Bliss, let us be friends. You can keep on pointing out the advantage of Galaxia and I may keep on refusing to accept your arguments, but even so, and despite that, let us be friends. 
and he held out his hand. Of course, Travis, she said, and their hands gripped each other strongly. 42. Travis grinned quietly to himself. It was an internal grin, for the line of his mouth didn't budge. When he had worked with the computer to find the star, if any, of the first set of coordinates, both Polorit and Bliss had watched intently and had asked questions. Now they stayed in their room and slept or, at any rate, relaxed, and left the job entirely to Trevise. In a way, it was flattering, for it seemed to Trevise that by now they had simply accepted the fact that Trevise knew what he was doing and required no supervision or encouragement. For that matter, Trevise had gained enough experience from the first episode to rely more thoroughly on the computer and to feel that it needed, if not none, then at least less supervision. Another star luminous and unrecorded on the galactic map showed up. This second star was more luminous than the star about which Aurora circled, and that made it all the more significant that the star was unrecorded in the computer. Trevise marveled at the peculiarities of ancient tradition. Whole centuries might be telescoped or dropped out of consciousness altogether. Entire civilizations might be banished into forgetfulness. Yet out of the midst of these centuries, snatched from those civilizations, might be one or two factual items that would be remembered undistorted such as these coordinates. He had remarked on this to Polorit some time before and Polorid had at once told him that it was precisely this that made the study of myths and legends so rewarding. The trick is, Polorid had said, to work out or decide which particular components of a legend represent accurate underlying truth. That isn't easy and different mythologists are likely to pick different components, depending, usually, on which happen to suit their particular interpretations. In any case, the star was right where Deniador's coordinates, corrected for time, said it would be. Trevise was prepared, at this moment, to wager a considerable sum that the third star would be in place as well. And if it was, Trevise was prepared to suspect that the legend was further correct in stating that there were fifty forbidden worlds altogether, despite the suspiciously even number, and to wonder where the other forty-seven might be. A habitable world, forbidden world, was found circling the star and by this time its presence didn't cause even a ripple of surprise in Trevise's bosom. He had been absolutely sure it would be there. He set the far star into a slow orbit about it. The cloud layer was sparse enough to allow a reasonable view of the surface from space. The world was a watery one, as almost all habitable worlds were. There was an unbroken tropical ocean and two unbroken polar oceans. In one set of middle latitudes, there was a more or less serpentine continent encircling the world with bays on either side producing an occasional narrow isthmus. In the other set of middle latitudes, the land surface was broken into three large parts and each of the three were thicker north-south than the opposite continent was. Trevise wished he knew enough climatology to be able to predict from what he saw, what the temperatures and seasons might be like. For a moment, he toyed with the idea of having the computer work on the problem. The trouble was that climate was not the point at issue. Much more important was that, once again, the computer detected no radiation that might be of technological origin. What his telescope told him was that the planet was not moth-eaten and that there were no signs of desert. The land moved backward in various shades of green, but there were no signs of urban areas on the day side, no lights on the night side. Was this another planet filled with every kind of life but human? He rapped at the door of the other bedroom. Bliss. He called out in a loud whisper, and rapped again. There was a rustling, and Bliss's voice said, Yes. Could you come out here? I need your help if you wait just a bit, I'll make myself a bit presentable. When she finally appeared, she looked as presentable as Trevise had ever seen her. He felt a twinge of annoyance at having been made to wait, however, for it made little difference to him what she looked like. 
but they were friends now, and he suppressed the annoyance. She said with a smile and in a perfectly pleasant tone, What can I do for you, Trevis? Trevis waved at the view screen. As you can see, we're passing over the surface of what looks like a perfectly healthy world with a quite solid vegetation cover over its land area. No lights at night, however, and no technological radiation. Please listen and tell me if there's any animal life. There was one point at which I thought I could see herds of grazing animals, but I wasn't sure. It might be a case of seeing what one desperately wants to see. Bliss listened. At least, a curiously intent look came across her face. She said, Oh yes rich in animal life. Mammalian. Must be. Human. Now she seemed to concentrate harder. A full minute passed, and then another, and finally she relaxed. I can't quite tell. Every once in a while it seemed to me that I detected a whiff of intelligence sufficiently intense to be considered human. But it was so feeble and so occasional that perhaps I, too, was only sensing what I desperately wanted to sense. You see she paused in thought, and Trevise nudged her with a well. She said, the thing is I seem to detect something else. It is not something I'm familiar with but I don't see how it can be anything but her face tightened again as she began to listen with still greater intensity. Well, said Trevise again. She relaxed. I don't see how it can be anything but robots. Robots? Yes, and if I detect them, surely I ought to be able to detect human beings, too. But I don't. Robots? said Trevise again, frowning. Yes, said Bliss, and I should judge, in great numbers. 43. Polorit also said robots. In almost exactly Trevise's tone when he was told of them. Then he smiled slightly. You were right, Golan, and I was wrong to doubt you. I don't remember your doubting me, Janov. Oh well. Old man, I didn't think I ought to express it. I just thought, in my heart, that it was a mistake to leave Aurora while there was a chance we might interview some surviving robot. But then it's clear you knew there would be a richer supply of robots here. Not at all, Janov. I didn't know. I merely chanced it. Bliss tells me their mental fields seem to imply they are fully functioning and it seems to me they can't very well be fully functioning without human beings about for care and maintenance. However, she can't spot anything human so we're still looking. Polorit studied the view screen thoughtfully. It seems to be all forest, doesn't it? Mostly forest. But there are clear patches that may be grasslands. The thing is that I see no cities, or any lights at night or anything but thermal radiation at any time. So no human beings after all. I wonder. Bliss is in the galley trying to concentrate. I've set up an arbitrary prime meridian for the planet which means that it's divided into latitude and longitude in the computer. Bliss has a little device which she presses whenever she encounters what seems an unusual concentration of robotic mental activity I suppose you can't say neuronic activity in connection with robots or any whiff of human thought. The device is linked to the computer, which thus gets a fix on all the latitudes and longitudes, and will let it make the choice among them and pick a good place for landing. Polorit looked uneasy. Is it wise to leave the matter of choice to the computer? Why not, Janov? It's a very competent computer. Besides, when you have no basis on which to make a choice yourself, where's the harm in at least considering the computer's choice? Polorid brightened up. There's something to that, Golan. Some of the oldest legends include tales of people making choices by tossing cubes to the ground. Oh? What does that accomplish? Each face of the cube has some decision on it yes no perhaps postpone and so on. 
whichever face happens to come upward on landing would be taken as bearing the advice to be followed. Or they would set a ball rolling about a slotted disc with different decisions scattered among the slots. The decision written on the slot in which the ball ends is to be taken. Some mythologists think such activities represented games of chance rather than lotteries, but the two are much the same thing in my opinion. In a way, said Trevise, we're playing a game of chance in choosing our place of landing. Bliss emerged from the galley in time to hear the last comment. She said, no game of chance. I pressed several maybes and then one surefire yes, and it's to the yes that we'll be going. What made it a yes? Asked Trevise. I caught a whiff of human thought. Definite. Unmistakable. 44. It had been raining, for the grass was wet. Overhead, the clouds were scudding by and showing signs of breaking up. The far star had come to a gentle rest near a small grove of trees. In case of wild dogs, Trevis thought, only partly in jest. All about was what looked like pasture land, and coming down from the greater height at which a better and wider view had been possible, Trevise had seen what looked like orchards and grain fields and this time, an unmistakable view of grazing animals. There were no structures, however. Nothing artificial, except that the regularity of the trees in the orchard and the sharp boundaries that separated fields were themselves as artificial as a microwave receiving power station would have been. Could that level of artificiality have been produced by robots, however? Without human beings? Quietly, Trevise was putting on his holsters. This time, he knew that both weapons were in working order and that both were fully charged. For a moment, he caught Bliss's eye and paused. She said, go ahead. I don't think you'll have any use for them, but I thought as much once before, didn't I? Trevise said, would you like to be armed, Janov? Pelorid shuddered. No, thank you. Between you and your physical defense and bliss and her mental defense, I feel in no danger at all. I suppose it is cowardly of me to hide in your protective shadows, but I can't feel proper shame when I'm too busy feeling grateful that I needn't be in a position of possibly having to use force. Trevi said, I understand. Just don't go anywhere alone. If Bliss and I separate, you stay with one of us and don't dash off somewhere under the spur of a private curiosity. You needn't worry, Trevis, said Bliss. I'll see to that. Trevis stepped out of the ship first. The wind was brisk and just a trifle cool in the aftermath of the rain, but Trevis found that welcome. It had probably been uncomfortably warm and humid before the rain. He took in his breath with surprise. The smell of the planet was delightful. Every planet had its own odor, he knew, an odor always strange and usually distasteful perhaps only because it was strange. Might not strange be pleasant as well? Or was this the accident of catching the planet just after the rain at a particular season of the year? Whichever it was come on, he called. It's quite pleasant out here. Pelorid emerged and said, Pleasant is definitely the word for it. Do you suppose it always smells like this? It doesn't matter. Within the hour, we'll be accustomed to the aroma, and our nasal receptors will be sufficiently saturated, for us to smell nothing. Pity, said Pelorid. The grass is wet, said Bliss, with a shade of disapproval. Why not? After all, it rains on Gaia, too," said Trevise, and as he said that a shaft of yellow sunlight reached them momentarily through a small break in the clouds. There would soon be more of it. Yes, said Bliss, but we know when and we're prepared for it. Too bad, said Trevise, you lose the thrill of the unexpected. Bliss said, you're right. I'll try not to be provincial. Pelorid looked about and said, in a disappointed tone, 
there seems to be nothing about. Only seems to be, said Bliss. They're approaching from beyond that rise. She looked toward Trevi's. Do you think we ought to go to meet them? Trevi's shook his head. No. We've come to meet them across many parsecs. Let them walk the rest of the way. We'll wait for them here. Only Bliss could sense the approach until, from the direction of her pointing finger, a figure appeared over the brow of the rise. Then a second, and a third. I believe that is all at the moment, said Bliss. Trevise watched curiously. Though he had never seen robots, there was not a particle of doubt in him that that was what they were. They had the schematic and impressionistic shape of human beings and yet were not obviously metallic in appearance. The robotic surface was dull and gave the illusion of softness, as though it were covered in plush. But how did he know the softness was an illusion? Trevis felt a sudden desire to feel those figures who were approaching so stolidly. If it were true that this was a forbidden world and that spaceships never approached it and surely that must be so since the sun was not included in the galactic map. Then the far star and the people it carried must represent something the robots had never experienced. Yet they were reacting with steady certainty, as though they were working their way through a routine exercise. Trevis said, in a low voice, here we may have information we can get nowhere else in the galaxy. We could ask them for the location of Earth with reference to this world, and if they know, they will tell us. Who knows how long these things have functioned and endured. They may answer out of personal memory. Think of that. On the other hand, said Bliss, they may be recently manufactured and may know nothing. Or, said Polorit, they may know, but may refuse to tell us. Trevis said, I suspect they can't refuse unless they've been ordered not to tell us, and why should such orders be issued when surely no one on this planet could have expected our coming? At a distance of about three meters, the robots stopped. They said nothing and made no further movement. Trevis, his hand on his blaster, said to Bliss without taking his eyes from the robot, can you tell whether they are hostile? You'll have to allow for the fact that I have no experience whatsoever with their mental workings, Trevis, but I don't detect anything that seems hostile. Trevis took his right hand away from the butt of the weapon, but kept it near. He raised his left hand, palm toward the robots, in what he hoped would be recognized as a gesture of peace and said, Speaking slowly, I greet you. We come to this world as friends. The central robot of the three ducked his head in a kind of abortive bow that might also have been taken as a gesture of peace by an optimist, and replied. Trevis's jaw dropped in astonishment. In a world of galactic communication, one did not think of failure in so fundamental a need. However, the robot did not speak in galactic standard or anything approaching it. In fact, Trevis could not understand a word. 45. Polorit's surprise was as great as that of Trevis, but there was an obvious element of pleasure in it, too. Isn't that strange? He said. Trevis turned to him and said, with more than a touch of asperity in his voice, it's not strange. It's gibberish. Polorit said, not gibberish at all. It's galactic, but very archaic. I catch a few words. I could probably understand it easily if it were written down. It's the pronunciation that's the real puzzle. Well, what did it say? I think it told you it didn't understand what you said. Bliss said, I can't tell what it said but what I sense is puzzlement, which fits. That is, if I can trust my analysis of robotic emotion or if there is such a thing as robotic emotion. Speaking very slowly, and with difficulty, Polorit said something, and the three robots ducked their head in unison. What was that? Said Trevis. Polorit said, I said I couldn't speak well, but I would try. 
I asked for a little time. Dear me, old chap, this is fearfully interesting. Fearfully disappointing, muttered Trevis. You see, said Polorit, every habitable planet in the galaxy manages to work out its own variety of galactic so that there are a million dialects that are sometimes barely intercomprehensible, but they're all pulled together by the development of galactic standard. Assuming this world to have been isolated for 20,000 years, the language would ordinarily drift so far from that of the rest of the galaxy as to be an entirely different language. That it isn't maybe because the world has a social system that depends upon robots which can only understand the language as spoken in the fashion in which they were programmed. Rather than keep reprogramming, the language remains static and we now have what is to us merely a very archaic form of galactic. There's an example, said Trevise, of how a robotized society can be held static and made, to turn degenerate. But, my dear fellow, protested Polorit, keeping a language relatively unchanged is not necessarily a sign of degeneration. There are advantages to it. Documents preserved for centuries and millennia retain their meaning and give greater longevity and authority to historical records. In the rest of the galaxy, the language of imperial edicts of the time of Harry Seldon already begins to sound quaint. And do you know this archaic galactic? Not to say no, Golan. It's just that in studying ancient myths and legends I've picked up the trick of it. The vocabulary is not entirely different, but it is inflected differently, and there are idiomatic expressions we don't use any longer and, as I have said, the pronunciation is totally changed. I can act as interpreter, but not as a very good one. Trevise heaved a tremulous sigh. A small stroke of good fortune is better than none. Carry on, Janov. Polora turned to the robots, waited a moment, then looked back at Trevise. What am I supposed to say? Let's go all the way. Ask them where Earth is. Polorit said the words one at a time, with exaggerated gestures of his hands. The robots looked at each other and made a few sounds. The middle one then spoke to Polorit, who replied while moving his hands apart as though he were stretching a length of rubber. The robot responded by spacing his words as carefully as Polorit had. Polorit said to Trevise, I'm not sure I'm getting across what I mean by Earth. I suspect they think I'm referring to some region on their planet and they say they don't know of any such region. Do they use the name of this planet, Janov? The closest I can come to what I think they are using as the name is Solaria. Have you ever heard of it in your legends? No any more than I had ever heard of Aurora. Well, ask them if there is any place named Earth in the sky among the stars. Point upward. Again an exchange, and finally Polorid turned and said, All I can get from them, Golan, is that there are no places in the sky. Bliss said, Ask those robots how old they are, or rather, how long they have been functioning. I don't know how to say functioning, said Polorid, shaking his head. In fact, I'm not sure if I can say how old. I'm not a very good interpreter. Do the best you can, pal dear, said Bliss. And after several exchanges, Polorit said, they've been functioning for twenty-six years. Twenty-six years, muttered Trevise in disgust. They're hardly older than you are, Bliss. Bliss said, with sudden pride, it so happens I know. You're Gaia, which is thousands of years old. In any case, these robots cannot talk about Earth from personal experience, and their memory banks clearly do not include anything not necessary to their functioning. So they know nothing about astronomy. Polorit said, there may be other robots somewhere on the planet that are primordial, perhaps. I doubt it, said Trevise, but ask them, if you can find the words for it, Janov. This time there was quite a long conversation and Polorit eventually broke it off with a flushed face and a clear air of frustration. 
Golan, he said, I don't understand part of what they're trying to say, but I gather that the older robots are used for manual labor and don't know anything. If this robot were a human, I'd say he spoke of the older robots with contempt. These three are house robots, they say, and are not allowed to grow old before being replaced. They're the ones who really know things their words, not mine. They don't know much, growled Trevise. At least of the things we want to know. I now regret, said Pelorit, that we left Aurora so hurriedly. If we had found a robot survivor there, and we surely would have, since the very first one I encountered still had a spark of life left in it, they would know of Earth through personal memory. Provided their memories were intact, Genove, said Trevis. We can always go back there and, if we have to, dog packs or not, we will. But if these robots are only a couple of decades old, there must be those who manufacture them, and the manufacturers must be human, I should think. He turned to Bliss. Are you sure you sensed but she raised a hand to stop him and there was a strained and intent look on her face. Coming now, she said, in a low voice. Trevis turned his face toward the rise and there, first appearing from behind it, and then striding toward them, was the unmistakable figure of a human being. His complexion was pale and his hair light and long, standing out slightly from the sides of his head. His face was grave but quite young in appearance. His bare arms and legs were not particularly muscled. The robots stepped aside for him, and he advanced till he stood in their midst. He then spoke in a clear, pleasant voice and his words, although used archaically, were in galactic standard, and easily understood. Greetings, wanderers from space, he said. What would you with my robots? 46. Trevis did not cover himself with glory. He said foolishly, you speak galactic. The Solarian said, with a grim smile, and why not, since I am not mute. But these. Trevis gestured toward the robots. These are robots. They speak our language, as I do. But I am Solarion and hear the hyperspatial communications of the worlds beyond so that I have learned your way of speaking, as have my predecessors. My predecessors have left descriptions of the language, but I constantly hear new words and expressions that change with the years, as though you settlers can settle worlds, but not words. How is it you are surprised at my understanding of your language? I should not have been, said Trevis. I apologize. It was just that speaking to the robots, I had not thought to hear Galactic on this world. He studied the Solarion. He was wearing a thin white robe, draped loosely over his shoulder, with large openings for his arms. It was open in front, exposing a bare chest and loincloth below. Except for a pair of light sandals, he wore nothing else. It occurred to Trevis that he could not tell whether the Solarion was male or female. The breasts were male certainly but the chest was hairless and the thin loincloth showed no bulge of any kind. He turned to Bliss and said in a low voice, This might still be a robot, but very like a human being in Bliss said, her lips hardly moving, the mind is that of a human being, not a robot. The Solarion said, yet you have not answered my original question. I shall excuse the failure and put it down to your surprise. I now ask again and you must not fail a second time. What would you with my robots? Trevis said, we are travelers who seek information to reach our destination. We asked your robots for information that would help us, but they lacked the knowledge. What is the information you seek? Perhaps I can help you. We seek the location of Earth. Could you tell us that? The Solarian's eyebrows lifted. I would have thought that your first object of curiosity would have been myself. I will supply that information although you have not asked for it. 
I am Sardan Bandar and you stand upon the Bandar estate, which stretches as far as your eye can see in every direction and far beyond. I cannot say that you are welcome here, for in coming here, you have violated a trust. You are the first settlers to touch down upon Solaria in many thousands of years and, as it turns out, you have come here merely to inquire as to the best way of reaching another world. In the old days, settlers, you and your ship would have been destroyed on sight. That would be a barbaric way of treating people who mean no harm and offer none, said Trevise cautiously. I agree, but when members of an expanding society set foot upon an inoffensive and static one, that mere touch is filled with potential harm. While we feared that harm, we were ready to destroy those who came at the instant of their coming. Since we no longer have reason to fear, we are, as you see, ready to talk. Trevise said, I appreciate the information you have offered us so freely, and yet you failed to answer the question I did ask. I will repeat it. Could you tell us the location of the planet Earth? By Earth, I take it you mean the world on which the human species, and the various species of plants and animals his hand moved gracefully about as though to indicate all the surroundings about them originated. Yes, I do, sir. A queer look of repugnance flitted over the Solarian's face. He said, Please address me simply as Bander, if you must use a form of address. Do not address me by any word that includes a sign of gender. I am neither male nor female. I am whole. Trevise nodded, he had been right. As you wish, Bander. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.